we're going to be providing services in a different way. Um, or I need a new room. I need a larger room because I'm looking to do some social skills classes or I'm looking to do some college prep courses because that seems to be an identified need for our students who are coming in with mental health concerns, especially our 11th and 12th graders. Um, or I may be implementing and then moving on to implementing these new procedures. I, I think that's, that's the main piece. But you let everyone know. That's, that, that's was a big shift, I think, within our district because sometimes administration or even myself as a school psychologist, I come through and want to just make stuff happen because I knew it was right but I needed to take that time to help people adopt the policy. All right, so moving on to our next slide here. And I'm sure most of uh, y'all, if you've been following school psychology for the, even the past year, <laughs> you've, been, you've heard at least one or two things about RTI, and I know some of the folk up and down the state, I heard one psychologist say, I'm tired of looking at the triangles, and I hear you. <laughs> um, but. I don't think we've looked at it in this way in regards to the continuum of mental health services. Um, we've mainly looked at academics and behavior. I'm gonna go through a few examples and then we'll close out our uh, video portion <laughs> today. Um, so let me go ahead and go through these few examples first. And the first one is looking across this multi-tiered approach across the levels. As you can see, the intensity of need goes up. Now I'm mainly be focusing on the behavior, but I don't wanna forget the academic piece. Because when kids come to see us as school psychologists, we're still interested in their academics, but that also leads me to interested in their mindset, interested in their motivation, interested in their cognitive growth and development. Um, so we're still considering those underlying developments, you know, issues when it comes to academics, and particularly about their um, development, but also in behavior, because usually this is where administrators, parents, and other people are referring for us. <coughs> so, this is, what I'm going to give you is just kind of the lay of the land starting at that bottom tier in the triangle um, of what, or examples that districts can look into in regards to the services that they need. And you can go ahead and do something similar, maybe as you're either following along in, at home or as you're following along here, you can kind of map out where do you think some of those services might be. So let's go on to the next side and looking at secondary interventions, tier one, and the examples, and we're gonna look at behavior. And so you have the teacher-parent conferences, um, which is always important, and I just went to back to school night, and then some of the other faculty here, we went to back to school night for our children, um, but this is an important time, also an important time for the school psychologist to be seen, or at least their services be heard about. Um, every year that I would go, I would have some handouts and information for parents, and sometimes all they do is take the flyer, they say, you know, I'm going to call this mental health agency, or they'd say, you know, I'd like for my child to see you, or I have a question about this or that in my child's IEP, but they knew they had access to us. Um, counseling groups, okay, um, and these may be maybe even lunchtime groups that are available to just about any student, and you may not necessarily be discussing in-depth counseling issues, but it may be more life skills. Um, I know one school psychologist, um, Vivian um, Rodriguez, um, she, when she was an intern a few years ago, she uh, put together this program called Teen Summit. And the students would come in and it would be very much almost like a talk show format, but the students would ask these in-depth questions about dating, relationships, drugs and alcohol, and she would do her research and come back and provide that format. Now I was their intern supervisor, but I was learning from her about really getting out in the community and doing preventative work, okay, and access for all the students. You got uniform policies in some school districts or dress codes, um, or point systems that some schools have, or a, and I mentioned before, the Safe and Civil Schools programs, and usually with the Safe and Civil Schools program or district-wide behavioral curriculum, you have access to that and people are talking the same language, hopefully, when it comes to behavior and other issues and possibly looking at the same type of data. Okay, you have Peace Builders, um, which is a more um, marketed program, um, usually for the elementary school range, but I've seen it also at K-8 or middle school range. Human Relations Training um, by the National Council of Community Justice um, and they may also do you know, race relations, um, socioeconomic understanding, dealing with diversity and other issues, and they'll come and provide training either for staff and or the students. Um, and attendance checks, which I've seen some administrators do. 
And these are just a few of the examples that happen at the first tier that's available to all the students. Moving up to the second tier, if there's an identified need beyond what's already available for behavioral or mental health issues, we're going to consider um, a more in-depth counseling group that would probably have definitely real clear parent permission, guidelines, clear topics and agenda. This is a little more than a lunchtime group. The students are probably meeting um, up to 40 minutes, maybe even an hour, um, and these counseling groups uh, may either be after school, they may be a part of alternative education, but we're providing some intensive support to retrain some, and provide replacement behaviors or replacement thoughts to some degree for those of my uh, rational and motive behavioral therapists out there. Um, peer mediators, and as an intern, I had a chance to help train either conflict resolution providers or peer mediators. And the students would refer themselves, but this group of students, it may be 10 to 12 students, were identified as kids who really were connected with the community and students trusted to help them solve their problems before they got to the point that administration needed to step in. Um, a, again, a point system um, and some of the rewards or consequences that go along with the point system. Um, Site-based mental health and helping, by this point, you're helping clarify a referral to whoever the provider is for site-based mental health. My sense is that, you know, with Medi-Cal funding and hopefully that continues, um, therapists may be able to provide mental health services from different agencies um, to our students if they, if they qualify for Medi-Cal. Um, mentor programs and male academies, which is one thing that we've had in Long Beach, um, which have identified issues for both academics um, at the middle school level and at the high school level, they look to provide support for leadership, but the students have to apply. So there's some screening level on that second tier. Um, and the last piece is um, either a parent conference and a more in-depth parent conference suggesting some types of referrals um, that's not on the regularly scheduled program as the back to school night is, um, or an administrative behavior contract. Right. Moving on to tier three. And this will be our last piece just before we um, close out here. Um, we have, as far as the behavior piece, maybe weekly counseling. Now, most mental health agencies do weekly counseling, counseling every week. If you're seeing a child every week, that indicates a significant level of need. And most schools are not set up to be a clinic. So you want students who require your highest level of support. And those are usually students who already qualify for special education, have demonstrated an emotional disturbance, and who need support each week, who need, even if they're not going to counseling, they may have some type of consultation with their teacher because they decided, I'm not doing any more counseling. <laughs> um, but there's some type of interaction with that student each week that the school psychologist is providing. You wanna make sure that um, you've tried every intervention you can before going to this. And this comes out to some of your time as well. Um, Site-based mental health may also have some of the students with more intensive needs and be able to help support in that level. Um, a 504 plan also for students who may have either um, some type of mental health need. I generally don't suggest a 504 plan for counseling because that's a service that needs to be paid for. Um, however, I've seen some people do it in that way. Um, and, or in particular, if a child is suffering from depression or other issues, they may be provided extended time and homework, especially if they're bipolar and other pieces, uh, but they're still able to follow along with the general ed curriculum. So their academics aren't suffering to the point where they're not able to follow along at you know, even getting grades of A's and B's. Um, a behavior plan, of course, that would be, or a behavior support plan that would be added to their IEP or even a behavior intervention plan if needed um, after a functional analysis assessment that's, you know, as is clearly laid out there in the law um, that a behavior intervention case manager would do that would be designated by the SELPA, um, which usually and should be, in my opinion, a school psychologist. Um, but I think I am a little biased there. 